to this workshop as well. So I'm a developmental psychologist by training. Um, uh, now a newly, new, newly a meta scientist. Um, uh, and I'm, but importantly for this talk, I'm just someone who has literally used Bayes factors in my own research a few times. Um, but I'm absolutely not a statistician, nor am I like even a stats heavy psych person, like I'm just a person. <laughs> so I'm going to be giving this talk very much from the perspective of like how to use this package and how to have enough understanding of base factors to be able to use this package in a way where you know what you're doing, but not like loads of theory about uh, base factors, not loads of like why Bayesian analysis is better than frequentist analysis, none of that. It will just be like use based. Why would you want to use them? When would you use them? How can you use them kind of thing? So I wanted to start off by so oh, and also um, something that I'm I'm going to be mostly focusing on null results, but you can apply all of this to um, not null results. It's just that I've mostly used base factors to uh, with null results. So I'll mostly be talking about that. So if you were running an experiment and this was the p-value that you got for your main test, um, how would you feel? You can put it in the chat. I don't know if I can see the chat. Oh, I don't, I don't think I can either. I can't work out how to see the chat while I'm uh, doing this. So maybe Sophie could read out if anyone has written anything of how they feel. Oh, I can yeah. see the chat. Yay. Oh, right, so yeah. you can see the chat. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah. it should pop up at the bottom for you. Got it now. Okay. Um, so definitely not significant. That's uh, that's interesting. So you wouldn't think it was kind of teetering on the edge. Sad. Oh no, I would cry. Too small data set or too small effect. Good point. I guess you um yeah, you wouldn't know that from the p value. Um, oh well, feeling like I won't be able to publish. My study didn't find anything interesting. Uh, not significant. So yeah, that's exactly how I think most people would feel in this situation. Um, okay, so let's, what about in this situation? Still sad. Where is the confidence interval? P-values are arbitrary anyway. Not enough power, trend, same, still sad. Without any further details, the p-values are not interpretable. Good point, definitely, <laughs> despite people relying on them very much a lot of the time. Okay, so um, the kind of thing that I wanted to pick up on this is, although both are not significant by like traditional frequentist p is less than 0 0.05, um, and a lot of people have said that they'd feel exactly the same, which is reasonable and, um, uh, you know completely normal some people have said stuff like a trend like maybe there wasn't enough power i know that someone said that for the other one as well but you might be slightly more likely to think about things like is it maybe an issue with sample size or something like that if you get this kind of marginal p-value like this um and so but the problem is is that you at the end of the day if you are using the standard criterion if, if you've decided that if it's less than P, um, 0.05, then it's significant. And if it's not, it's not, then you've kind of, you haven't really got anywhere to go from there and you don't know what it means. Um, okay. So I'm gonna be covering um, what is Bayesian analysis? Why should we do Bayesian analysis and how can we do Bayes, um, Bayesian analysis? So first I'll start with the what. Um, and again, please remember I'm not a statistician. Um, I just really liked this um, this kind of uh, vignette that I found online. So um, they, they're they comparing frequentist and Bayesian reasoning. So um, in this case, um, in the frequentist reasoning, you can hear the phone, your, the phone beeping. Um, you have a mental model which helps you identify the area from which the sound is coming. So by how loud it is and what direction and things like that. So upon hearing the beep, you infer the area of the home that you must look for to, um, to locate your phone and you go towards the kind of your mental model of where the sound is coming from. Um, whereas the Bayesian reasoning kind of equivalent of that would be you can hear the phone beeping and as well as all of this, you have this mental model 
Um, but you also know locations where you've misplaced your phone in the past. So you combine your inferences that you're getting from like where it seems like it is also with the locations that you think you might, um, you usually misplace it. So that prior knowledge um, and that helps you find the phone. And I know that in my case, this prior knowledge has been very useful because the main place that I lose my phone is in my dressing gown pocket. And I never, there's loads of stuff in that area. So if I just go to that area, I would never find it. And I've learned the hard way that I should just remember it's almost always there. So um, in Bayesian analysis, generally you can do like really complicated stats. You can do um, loads of different things and lots of people who are kind of diehard Bayesians really hate Bayes factors. So Bayes factors are only one type of Bayesian analysis. Um, and they are an, in, in simple terms, an indice of relative evidence of one model over the other. So um, like I said, you can use them for uh, loads of different things, um, but and you can use it for like model comparison. So two, two different models that you're comparing, but the case that I'm gonna be talking about is when you're just comparing your experimental model to the null hypothesis, basically. Um, so that's the case that I'm gonna be talking about, but keep in mind that with this package that I'll show you and with Bayesian analysis in general, you can compare any two models. Um, and they also can be considered the degree by which your um, some prior beliefs about the relative credibility about two models are to be updated. So that's a bit more like a theoretical way of thinking about it, but that I won't kind of be describing it as that when I explain further down the line, I'm gonna be using this um, indice of red relative evidence of one model over the other. That's what I kind of will be focusing on. So why would you wanna use these? Why would when, you know, I mean, I'm sure I'm usually uh, talking to a very different crowd to our ladies. So usually I would use the thing of like, we all hate stats. So uh, how do we, why would we want to do even more? But th I'm sure that isn't the crowd that I'm with today. <laughs> mm. So, but you still might wonder why would I, why would I want to do Bayesian analysis if, um, you know, uh, I'm happy with what I do already. Um, and the issue basically is that researchers often conclude that an effect is absent when a null hypothesis significance test yields a non-significant p-value. Um, but it's not actually logically or statistically correct to conclude that an effect is absent when your hypothesis test is not significant. So you often see um, in studies where maybe there's a control group um, and you want to show that in the control group you don't have this significant um, effect maybe. Um, and that is used to hold up quite a lot of the theory of the paper and yet you can't really do that if you're using frequentist statistics in this way, um, in the kind of traditional way of just having a p-value and an effect size. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's where Bayes factors can help um, because they provide useful statistical tools to improve your inferences about null effects. And this isn't to say that this is the only way, and I know that there are ways that you can do this with frequentist statistics, um, we, uh, there are definitely other ways, but this is just the way that I learned first, if I'm honest, and also uh, that I find quite easy to do um, and quite intuitive to explain what the results mean. So that's why I use it. But if you're doing something else to do all of this, then uh, then there's, I'm not going to really teach you anything new today that's very useful to you. <laughs> so when you're publishing, people did say in the how would you feel, some people said, Oh, I would be scared that I'm not going to be able to publish um, and that's very common fear with null results um, and although you know we do want a situation where everything can be published and your results aren't considered less meaningful if they are null um, for that to be true we need our statistics about our null results to be meaningful um, and so by using something like as one example by using Bayesian statistics or, or Bayes factors we can make those null results meaningful and be able to tell what can we actually conclude from this even though it's a null result how? So there's many ways to compute Bayes factors. Um, there's some really cool online calculators that where you literally just go to a website and you can put in some details and then calculate your Bayes factor. Um, the only thing is, is that, well, one thing that I didn't like about them when I was taught them is that I, f I felt like in a way they actually required more understanding than, um, than the package that I'm gonna show you because even though it's checkboxy, if you don't know what to put in those check put into those boxes, or you feel like you might be putting the wrong thing into those boxes, then you can have a lot of kind of worry that your what you're computing actually is nonsense. And a lot of the guesses that I made were very not right um, when the teacher came around in the workshop and said, "No, that's not what we mean by that word." And across the different calculators, they often ask for different things. 
and also these calculators can't always be used for like um, more complex designs than maybe like a two two group comparison. Um, they might have made more advanced versions since I made these slides because it was a few years ago. Um, so if you prefer kind of tick boxy things, but again, we're in an all ladies workshop, so I'm sure that's not something that you would prefer. Um, but they're an option if you want them. Um, then there is also JASP, which I'm sure loads of you are aware of, um, open source software, point and click, but also comes with code. JASP is really great um, as well. And I've heard good things from people who use that to compute base factors. So yeah, if you're, if you're already a JASP user, that would definitely be a way you could go about it. Um, but if you love R, which I'm sure you do if you're here, then there's also lots of options even within R. So um, if you are a true kind of Bayesian, you really want to get like fully into this, you love the theory of it, you do all your stats are Bayesian, you don't do kind of a bit of a bit of both, um, then you might want to use something like BRMS, which is where you can like build really cool Bayesian models. Um, and when I was doing my PhD, there was a student in my lab who was like so excited after the same Bayes, uh, Bayes workshop that I'd gone to. And he went straight into this and did this for all of his PhD um, and got fully obsessed. So if you want to become like that, you can feel free. Um, I, on the other hand, completely zoned out for the entire part of the workshop where that was introduced um, and got a bit overwhelmed. Uh, and so I really enjoyed when they introduced um, Bayes, the Bayes Factor package. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. So, um, so the base factor package is basically a package to compute base factors for a number of research designs and hypotheses um, that are common that we commonly use in, in psychology, but in lots of different fields as well. Um, so it's the, it's kind of set up to be a mirror of the frequentist tests that you'd normally run, which is really great if you are trying to use them in this way where you're mostly doing frequentist analyses and then you want to kind of supplement it with some Bayes um, or maybe you do want to do only Bayesian analyses but you want to kind of be able to picture which one would make sense for your design and so in that way you kind of work out what you would normally do and then go find the Bayesian equivalent so I really like that about it um, because often the way that I do things is to report both. So then I can just basically have my code for the frequentist and then have my code for the Bayesian straight under. And the code is really nicely sim similar to the frequentist version. So you're literally just changing the, the bit at the beginning, which you'll see. Um, so I really like that about it. So I'll go through a few pros and cons. So it's, um, this package is really easy to use if you already use R. Um, it can be applied to most common designs um, and you don't have any decisions to make. Um, so one thing that I didn't talk about before that I'll talk about now, um, so I'm just going to pause on this slide for a while, even though it doesn't make sense, is um, even though I talked at the beginning about um, the thing about Bayes, uh, Bayesian analysis is that you have, you're combining your prior knowledge um, with, uh, that's, that's what you're adding that the frequentist analysis doesn't have. So something people worry about a lot then is, well, what is my prior knowledge? How would I work out what my priors are? And that's that's something that, you know, I had a two day workshop on base factors and only was just uh, starting to grasp. Um, and I'm not saying that you can't grasp it. There's loads of great resources out there. So feel free to go ahead and do that. But I wanted kind of to find something that I could use now, even if I don't know what my informative priors would be. Um, but as a kind of, instruction into what it means to have an informative prior it basically is what do you what do you at the moment what do you think the true effect looks like if it exists so um would it be is it that like there's been loads of research done in this area and loads of meta-analyses that include both published and not published data and therefore you've got a really good effect size estimate for what is the average effect um in this type of study um, then you could have that as kind of your mean for if you're imagining so the prior is a distribution. So um, it doesn't have to be a normal distribution, but if we imagine that it is a normal distribution, the, imagine that the mean of it is that, uh, that effect size that you have um, estimated from all these meta-analyses and things. So then you're deciding, well, do I think that it's just a normal distribution for how likely any other effect size is um, for this? Or is it that um, I should have really done, done a normal distribution graph and it would have been a bit easier to explain. Or is it that um, it's much more likely that it's exactly that effect size, but nothing around it, in which case you'll have a really skinny, you know, like a, a not a normal distribution, a really squished one. Um, or is it that it's just as likely for anything, 
except it's completely impossible in your eyes that it will be the opposite direction, in which case the distribution when it crosses that axis, the x-axis, will just disappear. So, it, um, or is it that literally any effect size that you can imagine is equally likely, in which case it would just be a straight horizontal line? Um, so these are all the kind of decisions you'd have to make if you were thinking about what an informative prior is for the, for the, um, the uh, test that you're doing. Luckily for this, you don't have to do that. So <laughs> that's uh, why I didn't include a huge section on it. Um, uh, yeah, which is uh, a pro for me. But what are the cons? Um, so because you don't have any decisions to make, it is really inflexible. So if you do go away and you work out all these things about your prior, it's quite frustrating to use this package because then you can't, there's a, I think there's like a few options for what your prior is, um, but you can't kind of do really specific, uh, have a really specific prior for what you're doing. So that's bad if you do want to do something really specific. It could be considered like bad Bayes by many, um, especially by people who, like I said, are like diehard Bayesians. Um, they would think that this is a bit of a cop out a lot of the time. But I mean, the package was made by famous Bayesian people. So there are definite, there is definitely a crowd that believes that having a standard prior is more informative in a way because we just have no idea what the true effect size is of most things in the literature, especially because of publication bias and stuff like that. Um, so there's definitely a crowd that thinks that this isn't bad, but some will think it's bad, as with most stats. Um, and so as I, even though it's good that you don't require a lot of understanding, um, obviously we should have understanding of the stats that we're doing. So in an ideal world, we would really perfectly understand everything that we're doing. But personally, and I think for a lot of other people, even when I'm doing frequented statistics, I don't always have a huge understanding of exactly what's happening um, underneath it all. Um, and so it's no different from that if you have kind of enough understanding to do it, then that's usually the bar that you would set for yourself with frequented statistics. So you might as well set the same bar for Bayesian is the way I think about it. So uh, how would you do this? So basically what you do is you first assess to assess whether you have support for the null. Um, so with this package, it automatically computes the BF10, which is basically in support of the experimental hypothesis. So if you're doing this test because you have got a null result, um, then this will be less than one. So if this is less than one, you have more support for the null than the experimental. Um, but how much is what you really wanna know. So if you do one over the number that you get for the BF10, then you get what is called the BF01, which is your base factor in support of the null hypothesis. Um, so they're just a flip of each other. And that means whatever that number ends up being means your data are that many times more likely under the null hypothesis than under the experimental hypothesis. And this is really cool because this is like intuitively a way that we do talk about frequent statistics a lot of the time. Um, uh, like, you know, when people get their interpretations of p-values wrong and things like that, often they're given quite a Bayesian, like, definition of a p-value. So I feel like intuitively we do think about stats in this way. So it's good to do stats that actually match those intuitions. So let's have a go. Um, so let me, I was scared to have R up because um, sometimes uh, the computer then runs a bit too slow, but hopefully this will work. Let me just move you to the side. Okay. So this is um, a really simple script I made just for this with a mock data set that was kind of made out of a real data set that doesn't contain any, you know, nothing matches up. It was just kind of a mishmash. Um, so uh, I'm just going to uh, load the packages that I need. So for this, the, um, I'm, for what I'm going to show you, I only need um, the base factor package and ggplot. So I'll load them and I'll load in my data. So let's have a look. It's just, so this is, this was from my postdoc. Um, so it just has which condition were the kids in physical or digital Lego because this was, um, and uh, I'm trying to think whether this was an intervention design, the one that I fake made. Uh, no, it's not intervention. So just what condition, so they did a task, was it a digital version or a physical version? They're in year three or year four. Um, and then they have their scores on all of these different tasks. That's just what the data set is. Um, and then whether I want to, I think I only picked ones that 
could be used from for this mock data set so you don't need to include any of this stuff um okay so that's all you need to know so one thing that is like for this package, you could think you've done something massively wrong and it's just the most simple fix, which is often the case with R, is that you need to make sure that it knows which um, uh, it, it knows which variables are factors. So in this case, um, I've got their year group, which is a number, but I want it treated like a factor that it's year three and year four. Um, and so factor, I mean, so if I'm like woman splaining, I know that's not a thing, but like, <laughs> so if I'm woman splaining, uh, uh, like our stuff to people who are much more qualified than me but I'm just going to pitch to like the um a beginner and then uh if you know then that's great for you <laughs> so uh so yeah factor is um any categorical variable but it gets a bit confused if you have a number um for your categorical variable so I just want to tell it that year group and that lego condition are both factors um so I'll do that uh okay so I'm just going to plot some of the data so we can have a look at it and see what we think. So let me just move you. I'll just minimize all of us for now. Um, okay, so um, can you, I'm, now that I've minimized you, I can't ask you if you can, I can, I'm just gonna assume you can see everything and if you can't see what I'm talking about, then shout at me. Okay, so we've got a very simple box plot of which year they were in and their score on this task. So um, maybe, yeah, so intuitively, it doesn't really look like there's anything going on here. Uh, but just let's just do a t-test. This is just a normal frequentist t-test to see. Um, and so this is like the normal t-test, um, the way that you would write this out. So let's look at spatial scaling as a function of year. Um, and this is where the data is. Um, and so we've got this p-value, which is like very large. We're probably not thinking that it's you know, that's probably a real null, uh, is what we're thinking. Um, so if we want to do the base factor equivalent, this is just to turn it into an object, but yeah, so t it's exactly the same syntax. So um, t test base factor, the only difference is you put the formula equals, and then it's the exact same as this, as you can see, which is very handy. So we'll do the t test. Uh, the the Bayesian t test um, and then we just want to look at it so I'll just move you around again okay so this is what you get as the output so the thing that you uh, that we're looking at for the base factor itself is this so what I said before was that if it's under one you've got support for the null um, more support for the null than for the experimental so we can see that this is definitely under one and so if we just want to do the inverse of that we can just do one divided by that and so then we know that our base factor in this case is 3.77, okay? So I'll explain what that kind of, whether we think of that in a more thresholdy way or not in a bit. Um, but for now, um, that means that your data are 3.77 times more likely under the null hypothesis than under your experimental hypothesis. So very quick and very easy. Okay, so let's do another one. So this time we're looking at an interaction so we've got their year group and which condition they were in, digital or physical. So we're going to run an ANOVA. So we're doing um, AOV, spatial scaling as a function of year and also LEGO condition, um, same data. So here again, null results all around for both the main effect and the interaction. So this time it's ANOVA Bayes factor. Again, formula is exactly the same as for the frequentist. This is the output we get. So obviously it's a little bit different because it was in, uh, because we have multiple uh, base factors in the same way that we had multiple p-values in the other one. So uh, if we want to, I guess you, so yeah, this would be the, the base factor for both main effects plus the interaction. Um, this would be for, I think both main effects, but I'd have to look up whether it's, um, yeah, I think, I can't remember which the, out of the plus or the dot dot is the interaction. So someone tell me if they know, but basically, and then this is for each of your main effects, but I'm sure it's in the documentation for the package anyway. Um, so, oh, is it in the chat? Yeah, I knew it would be Suzanne when I knew someone had put it in the chat. Okay, so um, that one is the interaction. Yeah, so then I guess this is just both main effects and it doesn't give you the option for just the interaction which I think is a bit weird but maybe there's some way of getting that output okay so um then 
Oh, so then if we wanted for any of them, let's say we want the one with both main effects and the interaction. So we do one over that. And then this time we've got 40. So this time it's much more clear that they there's a lot of evidence that we don't have both main effects and an interaction. 40, uh, our data are 40 times more likely under the null than the experimental hypothesis. Okay. And then we can do another one for a correlation design, um, something a bit different. So in this case, we're looking at the effect of uh, so looking at the relationship between their score on sp the spatial scaling task and their score on the Lego task. And if you've looked at this at first, you might think, hmm, maybe there is something there. I mean, not when you look at the dots, but when you look at the line. Um, so let's see if there is. So in this case, we're doing a correlation test. Um, so um, uh, the spatial scaling is the first variable and the Lego score is the second variable. And we're doing a Pearson's correlation. Uh, and so again, we have a, a non uh, a null p value, but maybe kind of this is the situation where where we're a bit like, hmm, could this just you know is is this evidence for the null or is this just um, a bit you know if we'd had a different sample or a slightly larger sample, would we have got um, a different result? Um, so then this is exactly the same syntax again. So correlation base factor. Um, with the exact same syntax as above. Um, I'm not sure whether it's kind of, if I don't think it, it's equivalent to Pearson over any of the others, I don't know, but I would just use this as kind of the equivalent. Um, and in this case, we get this one over, and this time it's only 1.69. So our data are 1.69 times more likely under the null than the experimental hypothesis, which isn't very much. So they're not even doubly as likely. Okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint. And I'll make it so that I can see your faces again, because it's helpful to me. Uh, where is it? Okay. Okay. So, so how do we interpret base factors? Um, so, um, I mean, one of the good things about base factors is that you don't need to kind of go any further than this. It's quite informative. You can kind of let your reader interpret what they think of this. So if you're saying these data are 50 times more likely under the null than the experimental hypothesis, I, most reviewers will probably think, yeah, sounds like quite a lot. <laughs> um, but if you do want these kind of thresholds, and a lot of reviewers do, a lot of editors do, um, then a common system that's used is the system by Jeffries. Um, so that's these numbers here. Um, so basically, it's a flip. So it's exactly the same words around uh, around one, if you if you get what I mean, going up and down. So uh, this is all for a BF one O. So a base factor that the one before we converted it into the BF one. So the one that was less than one in our outputs. Um, so we. Uh, if you know what I mean. So this is all evidence for the null and this is all evidence for the experimental. Um, but, but yeah, so basically uh, if you have a between one, I'm just gonna talk about, because we did convert them, I'm gonna be looking at this top half of this um, and then just flipping the H1 for H0. I hope that's not too confusing. But basically what it means is that if you get a BF01 of um, between one and three, it's considered like anecdotal evidence for the null hypothesis, um, which is not very great. It's not, doesn't really tell you much. Um, if it's between three and 10, that's considered moderate evidence for the, um, the null hypothesis. Um, and if it's between 10 and 30, it's considered strong um, and 30 and 100, very strong and above 100, extreme. So that's, if you do want to kind of put a label on it, you can use those labels um, and obviously let's say we were doing a base factor for not a null result um, and we got um, uh, a really massive uh, positive, uh, a really massive BF10, then that would also be, if you wanted to supplement your frequentist results, you could just say, and with Bayesian analysis, we also get very strong uh, evidence for the experimental hypothesis. But obviously, like I said, I've been talking about null because I think it's useful in that situation. Um, question, Priya? Mm -hmm. Um, so on the slide before, like mm -hmm. the anecdotal evidence, mm -hmm. like, have you sort of ever got those values and how do you sort of like defend them and deal with them? Because I've got them before and they're mm -hmm. like, 
quite tricky things to deal with, like with reviewers, because I've had some when you get sort of because these goes along with sort of marginal p values and you get anecdotal evidence to say, ah, oh, yes, you know, this is interesting, say more. And then you have equally as many being like, no, you should not discuss this at all because it's mm. not considered statistically significant. Mm. Or, you know, or there's not strong evidence for it. Have you had experience of dealing with these anecdotal values and how have you dealt with them? So most of the time I have got values that are like in the three to 10 range. Um, so I've been all right with reviews and things like that. Um, when I have got ones that are smaller than that, I usually haven't been like resting on it as like the main evidence or like I kind of have just, that's been usually in papers where I'm just in, doing a B for every P. So for all of my P values, I add a base factor. Um, so I haven't had anyone pull me up on it before. I think to be honest, like I would just be honest about it in the paper and be like, you know, the base factor is inconclusive. So we don't really know maybe it was a sample thing, maybe it was, um, you know, uh, we, we can't really say anything right now, which is hard, but you could, I guess, in a response to reviewers, I would probably say it's it's not any, it's it's definitely no, it's definitely not less evidence than just having a null p-value, you know, like, um, so in a way, it would be really sad if, if reviewers saw that more unfavorably than just having the null p-value in there, and that's kind of a situation where in a lot of open science, you can have these rare scenarios where you almost end up shooting yourself by uh, in the foot by being not just shooting yourself that would be really bad <laughs> no you, you end up shooting yourself in the foot by being too transparent in a way so i would be sympathetic with someone who for that reason decided not to include them or something like that um like for the personal reason of that rather than the scientific reason um but yeah i don't have any good advice on that i'm sorry <laughs> okay, that's so good um i noticed as well someone has also asked a question in the chat Ooh. But okay. I don't know if they asked that a while ago. It was Suzanne, actually. What was the question? Can you read it out? Why doesn't the package have an invert function? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, I mean, maybe it does. Maybe there's like an extra bit of code you can put in and I just have been too silly and the way I was taught it was not to do that. Um, but should, maybe, or maybe you could make a function for that, Suzanne. Um, no, no, I, just, I was just wondering because it seems like, you know, such a simple thing to do, but Okay. You don't need the package to do it, but that's like the ultimate output that you should report, right? Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, I think that's true. I think it's because it wasn't invented for null results. So I guess it should definitely have the option. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree sense. with you, basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, OK, so if you wanted to know how to write up um, um, this kind of result, and um, this is an example from one of my papers. So you just want to say something like no statistical inference can be derived. This is if you're reporting your frequent statistics and then following up with Bayesian. No statistical in inference can be derived from this non-significant result um, to determine whether the current data provide evidence for the null hypothesis relative to the alternative hypothesis a base factor was conducted. Base factors provide a measure of how likely the data are assuming um, the null hypothesis is true relative to how likely the data are assuming the experimental hypothesis is true for the current analyses. And so this is the part that is specific to the package. So for the current analyses, a default base factor with a wide Cauchy distribution, scale of effect 0.707, was calculated using the base factor R package um, and yielded a base factor BF01 of 4.12. Thus, we can conclude that the data can constitute moderate evidence for the null hypothesis or replace moderate with whatever is on that scale if you want. Um, but you could also say, thus, we can conclude that the data are 4.12 times more likely under the null than the experimental hypothesis if you, if you don't want to use these cutoffs. Um, so thank you lots for listening. Um, why don't we have a few, any, as many questions as you want, and then people, and people can either be playing around um, with it with their own data at the same time or afterwards, whatever works for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Can you see the chat for it? People ask questions. There. Oh, yes, I can. Yeah, you can feel free to either put it in the chat or just unmute or put your hand up or anything you want.
Can this also be applied to mixed effect models? Is there a base factor equivalent? I think there was in that list, but let me check. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is great. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Mm -hmm. so more general about the presentation. Hi, Priya. <laughs> will you have, like, will you put the slides somewhere to have them available for, I don't know, if we want to check something? in the future yes. if we're using it yeah the slides are on my own that's the so the slides and the data that i was using are both in this uh, i'll put it in the chat so it's this folder if you go to the what to do with null results folder subfolder within this then that has both i mean it's not exactly these slides but it's very 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 similar and then also the data and the script for the one that i showed you so yeah, that'll be useful for the future, but also if you wanted now to like have a go at the um, at using the script that I used or editing it, then you can download that and do it do that as well. Um, and I think we had a question in the chat, which was, oh no, that was the one that I answered, wasn't it? Okay. Yeah, it can handle the mixed models. Uh, if the library can be used while creating Shiny App and probably the user can pick the values, do you mean the values for the, which values do you mean in that situation? Values for the tests, but like uh, the values like the means for your, both your groups or do you mean values like the values for the priors? values for the priors. Ah, um, I think if you had the, um, what's it called, like the base code that they used for the package, you could definitely play around with that. Um, I don't know much about Shiny apps, um, but yeah, I, so I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, I'm sure the, the code for the actual package exists, so you could just edit that directly if you wanted to. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, thanks for tuning in from India. Um, uh, yeah, that I hope that no, I'm not even the hope that answered your question because I know it doesn't. But yeah, hopefully. <laughs> um, okay, what about Suzanne? Uh, what journals would you recommend for a pre-registered, well-powered experimental study, high base factor results, but just that no significant results across the board? I would recommend, um, and you added a study with infants. I would recommend literally any good developmental journal that you would normally submit to because and I would write explicitly in the cover letter that you're really excited to submit to them knowing that they like value these things and that you think that like the inclusion of um, base factor analysis um, is kind of shows that you have uh, thought about whether the, whether the null results you're presenting are meaningful and you hope that they will um, kind of be forerunners in publishing um, uh, important uh, null result findings in infancy research and then see what they say because I've done a lot of calling editors bluffs in cover letters and it has always worked. <laughs> uh, just guilting them into it. Yes, that's what I do. And I would just write a really like, I mean, you'd always hopefully write a good discussion and you're a good author, so you would always do that. But, um, but just like really go into it in the discussion about like all the possibilities for why you might have got that null result. And, um, but not stuff like, oh, it probably was just a small sample size because if you're getting base factors like that, it's very unlikely that that's the case um, because I don't, I'm hopefully I'm gonna be able to explain this properly. But um, so with, um, uh, with base factor, so p values, they just like with small sample sizes, they just bounce around. And then with larger sample sizes, they are more likely to be true in either direction, if you know what I mean. Like um, if it's a true effect, then they're, they're going to be really tiny. Um, and if it's not, they won't be. Um, but with base factors, they are very small. Like if you're if this is tracking time, all my like weird gestures are good for gesture people in the room. Um, so yeah, if this is time, um, like all your te the d participants that you're adding, for example, um, then base factors will be very small on either side of um, one, 
and then they'll get bigger and bigger as time goes on well they won't go like that they'll get bigger and bigger as time goes on in the direction of you know null if it's null and um uh not and significant if it's not null so you can be confident if you're getting bigger base factors like that you can be um Re, like very reasonably confident that it's not a power issue um, and so you could definitely write that in in your discussion section as well and um can I maybe try to plot the base vector over time then and yeah. just add that in yeah there's a really good paper that just came out that Nivi's been working on for ages um let me just find it so she's done a really great paper on sequential um uh Bayesian sequential testing which I didn't have time to get into in this talk, but um, is really also something really interesting to dive into because it's a way, a way of determining your sample size by using um, Bayesian analysis and just repeating that analysis every time you add a participant, basically. Um, ah, it's this one. So, uh, is this the, yeah, so this is the final open access version, I think. So um, yeah, so I'd really recommend that paper. So you can basically, even though you didn't do Bayesian sequential testing, you could almost plot, like imagine that you did, like you said, what would your base factor have been after every participant and show that it, it wasn't just bouncing around and it did actually start getting bigger and bigger on the, um, for, for the, in favor of the null um, and show that that's a really strong result. Um, Base factors might bounce around a bit, but you're allowed to check them after every participant and see if they stabilize what Priya is saying. <laughs> yeah, so they'll bounce around a bit, but they won't get very large um, in either direction until they stabilize a bit. Um, and I think, I, I haven't read the paper version that I just put of Nivi's um, of Nivi's looking into that, but when I've heard the talk and stuff, I think she suggested 10 as a cutoff, um, or maybe six, I think 10 or six I've heard. But yeah, just read the paper and see. Um, uh, Suzanne's study definitely sounds like it's within that, so that would be great. You could be Nivi's first citation on that paper <laughs> if you um, whip it up quickly. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Oh, also something that I want to say, because um, I thought it was really interesting that Sophie said the thing about base factors at the beginning being part of open science, because I often think about how, like, they're not really in terms of, like, you could still do base factor analysis and never share any of your code and in that way like they're not any more open than anything else but i definitely think that they it's really cool how they're being used in that way to make to combat publication bias in order to basically say like hey like these results aren't any less important and i think there are some people who would argue you know well we should be publishing everything regardless of whether it's kind of conclusive or not um, and so they would say this is interesting but it doesn't really add anything but there is definitely a group that says you know we're not actually arguing that we should publish everything in the best journals we're arguing that like you know results can be important when they're null um, and so those people would agree you know when you have both of those types of people that's a bigger pool so you've got a bigger pool that agree that your paper needs publishing if that makes sense yeah, maybe if I can just sort of like chime in and say it, but like, yeah, I think I would consider it sort of important in addressing the replication crisis and the publication bias because it, as an author, it aids you in getting stuff published. And you can get into the whole debate as to whether, you know, should we be able to publish no results, but it helps you, as you used the word at the beginning, make meaningful um, contributions and interpretations of your data because where I have used them, where they've been really useful in a lot of my research, I've studied young and older adults. And in my tasks, I found task effect, but what I haven't found is age group differences. And I would argue this is really interesting because it shows that this particular thing I'm studying does not change with age. But at the end of the day, it is still a significantly non-significant result regarding the interactions to do with age group. But by using Bayesian analysis, I have been able to more robustly say, look, there definitely isn't a difference. This is meaningful because X, Y, Z. And I think that's why it's part of the broader theme of open science, I feel. Definitely. Really and good science, actually, good science. <laughs> I really agree. And I think that's like such a 
perfect scenario where it's like really theoretically interesting that you have found no difference between the groups and it's like you know you want to you would want to write the paper the same way but this enables you to write it in a way like for the right reasons if you know what i mean yeah <laughs> so when you i'm curious when you've done it have you used this package or have you done it a different way so yeah i have um i've used it the way sort of you talked about more recently but pre when, when i first did it i calculated the actual big values myself mm. and then did it that way yeah which is a which is a lengthier method because you have to calculate the individual big values for each main effect in each interaction and then yeah. you do like i think it's e to the power of one big over the other i can't remember exactly what it is it's it's possible it's not complex code it's just not as straightforward as this mm. <laughs> but now that, i have done it with face vector as well that's really interesting though like yeah i i definitely i think that's something you probably wouldn't you'd need a lot of understanding to be able to get to that point so that's really good that you almost <laughs> forced yourself to do it that way <laughs> yeah it's kind of thing where if you you sometimes find yourself in a situation where you don't have a choice so you have to learn like i think that's not mm -hmm. too dissimilar to your experience you didn't get effects so you're expecting to see effects and then you had to find ways to go about dealing with that and you know one way is base factor definitely yeah, definitely. <laughs> Any other questions? Question about the ANOVA output. Is the base factor about the model as a whole or about the individual effects as with p-values? Um, I think it was about the individual effects because it showed the different ones for each main effect and then that one that where it had it just the both main effects but no interaction and the one where it had both main effects and an interaction so yeah you're getting a value for each of those um and you could report them just after the frequentist versions um after each kind of uh you know at, after the p-value of each of those will the code and mock data be shared with attendees yes i put it in the chat the the same link that i put in the chat um that has the slides also has the data and code so it's this one you can also send it around the mailing list mm -hmm. that'd be great and 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 i will post a link on twitter so it will yeah. be made available I <laughs> good any other questions um so uh, not to people not to put people on the spot did but did anyone bring any data that they fancy having a go with the package on now i guess raise a hand or put it in the chat or something like that i won't judge you if you all didn't <laughs> suzanne did okay great uh cecilia tried with your data cecilia did, did you try while i was talking or another time or what no no now when you were talking about it, did it did it work yeah, but you know, you got those factors. <laughs> Just feel happy that I tried and things happened, right? So yeah, so so was it like tell the story? We need to know everything. This is oh, like usually when I do these workshops, like someone's like, I got it, and then like I run round and we're like, okay, tell me, what did it say? Uh, I, I I closed it already. Uh, <laughs> oh wow! Well, I I can only take that as a compliment that you know I did it in such an informative way that you didn't even find it exciting that oh, you. That's, that's, why, that's why I forgot the slides. I was just checking like what kind of like things meant. Ah, okay. That makes sense. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Very efficient. Okay. Um. Yeah. Bye to anyone who needs to leave. Just go ahead. That's fine. Um, but Suzanne and Marie have said that they want to try it out. So anyone else who wants to stay either to have a play with the data that I linked to or to play with their own data, then feel free to stay and I'm happy to, and then you can, we can turn our, our cameras on and I can just chat with you guys and see how it goes. Um, anyone else who wants to leave, please feel free to leave. Um, before people start leaving, although you are welcome to, uh, Marion, do you want to maybe say a quick something about our next one, just so that you're aware of what's happening next time, and then we will get back to this with Priya. Yes, so uh, our next meetup will be 